This week on the Writer's Detective Bureau. Areas of Responsibility, Nole Prosequi, and GPS Tracking. I'm Adam Richardson, and this is the Writer's Detective Bureau. Welcome to episode number 95 of the Writer's Detective Bureau, the podcast dedicated to helping authors and screenwriters write professional quality crime-related fiction. And this week, I'm answering your questions about how areas of responsibility differ from jurisdiction, the concept of nole prosequi, and what the law says about police using GPS to track suspects. As always, I need to thank my Gold Shield patrons, Deborah Dunbar from DebraDunbar.com, C.C. Jameson from CCJameson.com, Larry Keaton, Vicki Tharp of VickiTharp.com, Chris Ann, Larry Darter, Natalie Borelli, Craig Kingsman of CraigKingsman.com, Lynn Vitale, Marco Carocari of MarcoCarocari.com, Robert Mendenhall of RobertJMendenhall.com, Terry Swan, and Rob Kearns of KnightsFallPress.com for their support, along with my Silver Cufflink and Coffee Club patrons. You can find links to all of the patrons supporting this episode in the show notes at writersdetective.com forward slash 95. To learn more about using Patreon to grow your author business or to support this podcast, check out writersdetective.com forward slash Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. This week's first question comes from author L.K. Hill of authorlkhill.com. L.K. writes, Hi, Adam. Talk jurisdictions to me. I know big cities often have multiple precincts or stations to cover multiple jurisdictions within the city. But is there ever a time when multiple jurisdictions are housed within the same building or station? I'm writing a scenario where one detective realizes his case may be related to another case in a different jurisdiction. Could the cop working the other jurisdiction be in the same building as the first, or not so much? Number two, what would be the procedure for a scenario like this, in terms of who would work the case? Would the two detectives work together on it, or would one hand it off to the other? And number three, what's the most common way for one detective to realize his case might be part of, or related to, another open one? A database? An interdepartmental thing? Something else? Thanks so much for all your help. Aha, hungry for more info on jurisdictions, I see. <laughs> for starters, be sure to check out episodes 1, 23, and 77. In episode 1, I talked about geographic boundaries being a factor in jurisdiction, like a homicide happening in a federal park. In episode 23, I talked about dual sovereignty, which is when state and federal jurisdictions kind of overlap. And in episode 77, I talked about jurisdiction with respect to more proactive jurisdictions, like a narcotics trafficking case where you follow the suspects wherever the case takes you. And assuming you're still in your home state, your case need only have a nexus to the city or county where you work. Now, getting back to your questions, LK precincts or stations or divisions aren't the same as true legal jurisdictions, which is a good thing for how you want your story to unfold. Let's use Los Angeles as our example. If I was a detective in the LAPD, I'm not, but let's say that I am, we'd all agree that the jurisdiction of the LAPD is the entire city of Los Angeles, right? That's the area that the LAPD is responsible for providing police service. It's their area of responsibility. Because Los Angeles is a gigantic city, there are multiple divisions or areas within the LAPD, and each division has its own station. On the East Coast, it's more common to refer to them as precincts. But the concept is the same. The city is broken down into smaller subsections, whether they call that a precinct, a division, an area, or a beat is up to that agency. It's important to note that this concept of jurisdiction that we just agreed upon is not the same as where an officer has legal jurisdiction to arrest someone. I know that sounds kind of confusing, so let me explain. If I work for the LAPD and my jurisdiction, meaning my department's area of responsibility, is the entire city of Los Angeles, that does not mean that I have no jurisdiction as a police officer outside the L.A. city limits. I am a sworn peace officer with powers of arrest 
anywhere within the state of California. So I can still make an arrest as a police officer in San Francisco or San Diego. So don't fall into that trap of thinking our ability to arrest someone ends when they leave the city limits, like an old episode of Dukes of Hazard. Depending on the investigative unit I'm assigned to, I may work only in a specific division, only on cases within the boundaries of that division, or I might work in a unit that's based in our headquarters and works cases all over the city. It really depends on the department and the unit the detective is assigned to. The key thing to understand is that the detectives routinely work with other investigative units, whether that's within their own agency or a neighboring one. Regardless of whether the two detectives, in your scenario, LK, are in the same building or not, they would likely start working their cases together. And if not together, at the very least, with very regular updates, if they figured out that they were related. That would still be the case if they worked for the same department in different stations, or if they worked for two different agencies, like LAPD working with Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. About the only time a case would be handed off to the other detective would be if the investigation reveals that the crime actually occurred in the other jurisdiction. Like if I caught the case because a body was dumped in my city, but we determined the murder actually happened elsewhere, like in the unincorporated area of Los Angeles County, outside the city limits of L.A., then we might hand the case over to an L.A. sheriff's homicide unit especially if they found the actual crime scene where the murder happened, and all I have on my end is where the body was dumped. So I hope that makes sense. There are a lot of ways that detectives link cases together. One is by sharing information with other investigative units in the form of a bulletin or a request for information, where the investigating detective literally sends out a message saying, this is what I have. Does this fit with anything that you're working? Another common way is by working the investigation, by contacting the involved parties, the family members, the witnesses, the suspects, and checking to see if their names pop up in the report database. And if I see that my witness was also recently contacted as part of another detective's investigation, I'll call that detective to find out if there's anything that could link our two cases together. So I hope this helps, LK. Thanks so much for sending in your questions. Our next question comes from Rochelle San Gabriel. Rochelle writes, Hi, Adam. Thanks so much for your podcast. I'm a new listener and trying desperately to listen to all of your episodes, but haven't gotten through them all yet. I apologize if you've already answered these. My questions. In my story, an FBI agent working the case of a missing woman decides that her husband is responsible for killing her. She arrests him and he's locked up. Soon after, but before he's tried for the crime, the woman is discovered alive and well. Would my FBI agent personally go get him from prison? Or who would she talk to to get him freed? Thanks so much, Rochelle. Thank you so much for listening, Rochelle, and for sending in your questions. To start with, the FBI agent would need to have probable cause, meaning a significant amount of articulable facts to arrest the husband for murder. Realistically, the FBI would use that probable cause to secure an arrest warrant signed by a judge, not just make an on-view arrest like a local police detective in a homicide unit might. But either way, there needs to be enough evidence pointing toward the husband's guilt to be able to arrest him, not just simply a decision made by the agent. If the arrest was made by your FBI agent with the intention of charging him in federal court, which would be the most likely thing since it's a federal agent, the husband would likely be held in a federal detention center near the federal courthouse where he would be awaiting trial. If for some reason the case was going to be tried at the state level, meaning under state law in a superior court, like a local police homicide detective would do, then the husband would be held in the county jail awaiting trial. We tend to use the terms jail and prison interchangeably when we're just speaking normally, but now that we're talking about crime fiction and being precise, it's important to understand that prison usually refers to a state prison, which is where the husband would be sent after being convicted during a trial in the state's superior court. If the husband were convicted in federal court, which is where federal trials are prosecuted, then he'd likely be serving out his sentence in a federal penitentiary or possibly a 
a federal correctional institution. I know this sounds nitpicky, but knowing that prison describes a particular type of institution is worth knowing as a crime writer. So all of that to answer your real question, Rochelle, which is, would an FBI agent have to personally get the husband freed from custody? And the answer is no. The husband would be freed as soon as it was determined he was not guilty of the crime. All it would take is an order from the court that the husband be released, assuming that there was already a finding of probable cause beforehand. When this happens, the prosecutor, which in a federal case would be the U.S. Attorney's Office, would file a nolle prosequi into the court's record, which is a formal notice of abandonment of the case. Essentially, it's dropping the charges. As a local detective, if I arrested the husband for murder and booked him into jail, but I didn't have sufficient probable cause to convince a judge the husband was probably guilty of murder, the husband would actually be released immediately. Where I work, that statement of probable cause is a written declaration that accompanies the booking paperwork when I bring someone into jail. And that statement of probable cause, which we often refer to as a PC form for probable cause, is reviewed by a judge within a few hours of the booking. I also know that in other jurisdictions in other states, the probable cause may be reviewed as a formal appearance before a judge, even before an arraignment. Either way, if the husband was just arrested based upon an FBI agent's hunch and not sufficient facts, that husband would likely be out of custody before the sun even came up. Thank you so much for your questions, Rochelle, and thanks so much for listening. Ryan Elder writes, I have a follow-up question, if that's all right. Of course it is, Ryan. That's exactly what I'm here for. When it comes to warrants and court orders, there's a lot of information online about what evidence is needed prior to getting them. There's one situation that's been tricky to research, though. When it comes to the police tracking a suspect or person of interest, such as placing a tracking device on that person's car, what are the legal requirements for acquiring authorization to plant a tracking device or to follow that person around in general? I tried researching this, but most of the results that come up deal with cell phone tracking, and I'm not sure if the rules are different here. In my work in progress, the suspect is using a burner phone that the police do not know about, and I don't think they could find out about it, unless I'm wrong. If they cannot find out about it, in order to follow his car around without risk being detected, the only option would be to place a tracking device on his vehicle. But what prior evidence do the police need against the suspect before getting legal authorization to plant a tracker? Would hearsay be enough, since there is hearsay going around in my plot that he's the murderer, which is how the police find out about him in the first place? Or would they need more than hearsay? And if so, what? Thank you very much again. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Ryan. So as part of the landmark decision in United States v. Katz, and that's K-A-T-Z, which was a 1967 U.S. Supreme Court case regarding wiretap surveillance and the Fourth Amendment, Justice Harlan created the Reasonable Expectation of Privacy Test, which has two parts. Number one, an individual has exhibited an actual expectation of privacy, which is subjective. And two, the expectation is one that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable. So if I built a solid six foot wall around my backyard, I'm exhibiting an actual expectation of privacy. And it's one that society likely recognizes as reasonable that my backyard should be considered private since I've intentionally shrouded it from public view. Conversely, being out around town, driving or walking in public, is something publicly viewable and holds little expectation of privacy. Well, when we're talking about being visible and being followed as a part of a police surveillance. So following someone in public is likely not a violation of that person's Fourth Amendment right to be free from governmental search and seizure. I'd argue that best practice would be for the detectives conducting the surveillance to at least have reasonable cause to believe the person they're following is involved in criminal activity. With regards to GPS trackers, that is an entirely different story. The U.S. Supreme Court case of United States v. Jones, stemming from a 2005 case where police attached a tracker to Jones's Jeep as part of a drug investigation, resulted in the Supreme Court ruling that the warrantless use of a tracking device on a vehicle to monitor its movements on public streets was a violation of Jones's Fourth Amendment rights. 
technically this case hinged on the trespass by law enforcement onto Jones's property rather than an argument as to Jones's expectation of privacy. But the result of the case law is essentially the same. Police need a warrant to place a GPS tracker on a suspect's vehicle. Prior to this decision, which was decided actually in 2012, even though it stemmed from a 2005 arrest, but prior to 2012, GPS trackers were often used by law enforcement to obtain enough probable cause to get a search warrant for the suspect's home based upon the information gleaned from the surveillance data. Now that a warrant is required to install a GPS tracker, meaning the police need to have that probable cause in the first place, GPS trackers are not used nearly as often as they used to be for building probable cause in a case. So in your scenario, Ryan, you need far more facts than just whatever third-hand information your informants are passing on to your investigations. That said... What did the detectives hope to learn by tracking the suspect? Again, this goes back to strategy for the case. What will tracking his movements do to prove he was responsible for a murder? If this guy killed one person and the detectives are reasonably sure of his motive, are they trying to get a tracker in the remote chance that he might return to the scene of the crime or where the body is buried? I mean... Even if he returns to the scene of the crime, how do you prove that that has anything to do with actually committing the crime? My point is that it isn't necessarily a very solid reason to get a tracker warrant. But if the detectives think this guy is a potential serial killer that hunts at night by driving through the city, stalking his prey and trying to get them in his car, then that is a very different and way more compelling reason to seek a GPS tracker warrant. So thank you, LK, Rochelle, and Ryan for sending in your questions. And thank you for listening this week. This show is powered by your questions. So send them to me by going to writersdetective.com forward slash podcast. Thanks again for listening. Have a great week. Keep wearing those masks and write well.